will grace to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing in on our conversation on what we've been calling our out. As you and I as Christians, how do we relate to the world that's around us and all the different people that are in it? You see, our out as Christians is becoming more and more important to think about, especially here in the West, as we move into this post-Christian society. And what I mean by that is the neighbors, the people who are around us, less and less of them know, trust, and believe in Christ our Lord. How do we take the hope we share together here today, the hope that we gather around, the faith that we hold so dearly, and share it with those God has brought around us in our own lives? How do we reach our neighbor with the gospel of Christ? How do we, and I will dare to say the word, engage in evangelism? When you hear that word, what memories or thoughts are drummed up by the word evangelism? I think often the first image that comes to many of our minds is two young men knocking on our door with some badges wanting to have a conversation with us, right? I think that's by and large what comes to mind when you and I think about evangelism. Or perhaps maybe it's an image of an era gone by where whole arenas are filled out as a Billy Graham type preacher stands to share a message with the people and he invites them forward. Perhaps it's a far less vocal and far more visual reminder. You think of evangelism, you think of those iconic John 316 signs being held up at a baseball game or at a park or in some public place. Or maybe the word evangelism invokes something personal in you. Maybe it was a difficult, intense conversation you had with a friend about faith and life. Or perhaps maybe it's a future endeavor, one that you're preparing for, as your mind is drawn to those that are close to you, that you want to share Jesus with somehow, but you struggle with that how-to of it all. I think the word evangelism drums up a lot of different emotions, a lot of different things, a lot of different images to different people. And unfortunately, the idea of evangelism doesn't get much clearer as we turn our attention to our reading from the book of Acts this morning. This idea of evangelism, of the gospel going forth into all the world, looks very different in many different places. You see, all over this book are stories and examples of the early church engaging with a world that's very similar to ours, with the gospel of Christ. Let's just take the first four chapters of the book of Acts. We'll just limit our scope to those chapters here today, because a lot's happened in those first four chapters. In chapter one, Jesus sets the stage for what the whole book of Acts is going to be like. He says... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria to the very ends of the earth. In this, Jesus very conveniently outlines what's going to happen throughout the rest of the book. The gospel will travel from the city of Jerusalem. It'll go just a little further outside to Judea will go a step just a little bit further into Samaria and then take the leap to the very ends of the world. In fact, by the end of the book of Acts, the message of Christ, the good news of the gospel, has been taken from a room in Jerusalem to the very streets of Rome, the center and beating heart of the world in its day. Jesus sets the tone for the mission. It's to go out. It's to go everywhere and anywhere. And the mission begins in chapter 2 with the famous Pentecost verses. I mean, you, you can imagine those Sunday school lessons where you turn the fan on so the wind would blow in the house and you held up your little tongues of fire. Well, the wind, the Holy Spirit, descends on the house where the disciples are. The tongues of fire settle on their heads and they're equipped for the ministry that God has prepared them for. They start speaking in other languages, and the crowds 
of Jerusalem come to hear what the commotion is all about. And Peter in chapter 2 stands and delivers a sermon. He's speaking to these people who've gathered for Pentecost, and about 3,000 people are baptized and brought into the church in that very day. Evangelism, the public sharing of the gospel, is shown through the words of Peter. But sometime a little later in chapter 3, Peter and John walk together to the temple in Jerusalem. Entering into it, they see a man who was born lame, a man who is unable to walk since birth. And he's asking at the gate for alms and charity from the people who walk in. Peter brings healing in Jesus' name to the man as he stands and walks. The crowds are stunned by this act because they know this guy. They know how many years he's been sitting there, and look, he's walking amongst us. They press in to see and hear everything that Peter and John have to share with them. And in the midst of this different form of evangelism, the temple guards arrest the three of them, Peter, John, and this man who's healed, and they're dragged before the high priest. In chapter 4, they're charged not to speak in Jesus' name, but boldly they go on preaching and teaching. Evangelism in this case is shown through signs and wonders, through this act of love and care for those who are in need. And evangelism is shown in its boldness, even in the face of persecution. But the ride doesn't stop there as the gospel is loudly proclaimed throughout all of Acts despite things like riots and arrests and beatings and even death of those who bring the message. It stands as this incredible narrative of evangelism that can inspire us as we read through this story together. God's still at work today doing similar things. The God at work hasn't stopped his work. We can see that as we look at the mission board as we gather in the North X. We see foreign missionaries who travel to far away places, to the very edge of the earth. We can turn our TV on and see athletes share their faith to millions in a moment as they tell them about the Lord Jesus. We even pray in our church each and every week for those who are persecuted in their faith, that those who persecute them might know Christ as their Lord. This mission, this mission of evangelism is happening all the time, all around us. And it's something we can rejoice at, we can wonder at, as we see how God lives and moves in the world. But while all these things are happening, and as we rejoice and see all these different things going on, there's a temptation that can rise in our hearts. And quite frankly, it's a rather easy one to fall into time and time again. And we can find ourselves quite often in the middle of it as we stand in awe of the evangelism that takes place in Scripture, of the evangelism that takes place in the world around us, we see the many and creative ways that the gospel of Jesus is shared, we might be tempted to think that for you and me, evangelism is just a little above our pay grade. As we consider evangelism in these great and amazing ways, we can look at what you and I can do or feel comfortable doing and see the work of evangelism as just conveniently unattainable to us. That it's something for those super people that God has made over there, those called missionaries, those who are trained, who can go do X, Y, or Z, and it's not for lowly people like you or me. That those who engage in evangelism have some gift that I don't possess, therefore, I cannot. That there's some extreme use of will and faith and mind that I might mess up if I don't do it the right way. So I shouldn't. But that it must be done through some training I don't have or some program I'm not in. The work of evangelism always seems to be conveniently a level or two above who we are and not something for us. At first glance, as we hear all these incredible moments, as we see all these things happening before us, as we read through the book of Acts, or we see it happening in the world around us, it's easy to begin to feel that way. 
especially when we think of evangelism as some mighty use of our own will and power, some measure of our faithfulness or some testing of our knowledge, will never be enough. We'll always not be on the level that we think we need to be. Then the temptation is to use this as a rather convenient crutch to not share, to not engage, to not speak to the neighbor the hope that we have in Jesus. Do you hear how Satan robs your neighbor of the hope that's in us? As we return to Scripture, as we read carefully, we see the apostles driven, not by their exceptional talent, intelligence, or aptitude, but by the Holy Spirit. Here again the words of Jesus before he's taken up and his ascension day. But you, speaking to those gathered disciples, will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit, the one that fell on them at Pentecost, is the one who drives the mission. It turns fearful and confused men who hide in the upper room, who wait to be moved first in order to go out and share into apostles and evangelists. Hear from our reading today as they're dragged in front of the high priest to give account for their preaching and healing. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. So God the Holy Spirit dwells in them, drives them to evangelism, drives them to share the good news of what Christ has done. But what do they say? What do they speak? Here is their charge not to share their message. It's what's being spoken here as the court speaks to them. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the, sight of, in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them. Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. That last phrase of what they've seen and what they've heard. It's the very story and message of Christ. The hope they have in the forgiveness won for them through Jesus' death on the cross and the hope in the new life they share together in Jesus' glorious resurrection. The things they've seen for themselves, experienced, watched with their own eyes, heard with their own ears. The Spirit drives them to be witnesses, to share what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced from Christ our Lord. The Spirit leads them to speak it, to share it, that others might know Jesus. But even for the apostles, for Peter and John and the rest of that early church, evangelism is not an easy thing. It's met with resistance, with struggle, with persecution. As the Spirit drives them to share the message they've seen and heard, the world, Satan, evil, pushes back against them. And they cry out for help. Hear how they pray in the face of opposition. And now, Lord, look upon their threats, speaking of those speaking against them, and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And how does God answer their prayer? like a mini Pentecost as the Spirit is yet again poured out on them. Hear from our text. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. God gives of His Spirit to continue the mission, even in face of opposition, of struggle, of discomfort, God pours himself out that the word might go forth. So thinking through all of this, the Holy Spirit has gathered together common people, normal human beings. The Holy Spirit has equipped them with the message of the things that they've seen and heard about Jesus. And that same Spirit sends them in boldness to share. I think so often when we think of evangelism, it's me-centered. 
It's what I know, what I can do, the things I'm comfortable with. But here in Acts, we see so clearly that without the Holy Spirit, all of this grinds to a halt. Without this Holy Spirit driving the message to go into all of the world, it's doomed to fail. But with the Spirit, what wondrous things happen. Through word shared, through acts of love, through the amazing gifts and talents given to these apostles, the world hears about Jesus. And that, and you travel to near, if you travel to every continent here today, there is someone who knows about Jesus. And it all begins with the work the Spirit starts in this chapter. What a beautiful thing to consider. But this morning, as the Spirit has drawn us together, has brought us together here in church, as He's equipping us, let's change our perspective on evangelism this morning. You see, because you, dear Christian, today, as you sit in the pew, as you join the ranks of Peter and John as common, normal people, you have been given the same Holy Spirit. You do not have some lesser version, some discount amount of God in you, but the same Holy Spirit that worked in Peter and John is alive and dwelling in you. The Spirit that was promised by Jesus and poured out on the world, the Spirit that guided Peter and John even in the face of persecution, the Spirit who equipped them in boldness, now sends you. What does that Spirit send you to do? to share what you've seen and heard. That as we gather in this place around Christ our Lord, as we receive from him his gifts of grace and mercy, as we experience the love we share for one another here in this place, God is showing you exactly who Jesus is. As you experience his grace and mercy, as you experience his love, as you wonder as being a part of his body here in this place, drink deeply of Christ our Lord here in this place because it's not only for you, but it's for the people you meet out there. Drink deeply of all the things you've seen and heard. Drink deeply of Jesus this morning as you prepare to be sent by the Spirit out into the world. And then I think the most dangerous prayer, the prayer for the gift of boldness, for that same Holy Spirit who's equipped you, who's brought you here this morning, who helps you drink deeply of Christ our Lord, is the same Spirit who gives you that gift of boldness. Ask for it. Pray for it. That that Holy Spirit might send you into the world, send you to the people God has put around you, that you might share the good news, the things that you've seen and heard. So what does evangelism look like? Is it holding up a sign? Is it knocking on doors? What is God calling us to do here in this place? And the beauty of it is that it's unique to you. It's unique to who God has made you, who God has equipped you, who God has put around you. Evangelism looks like telling a dear friend about the hope we have in Jesus. Evangelism looks like praying for those who are in desperate need of God's help. Evangelism looks like inviting others to church to drink deeply of the same Jesus that you and I drink deeply of. Evangelism looks like sharing the love we first receive, preparing meals, calling those we haven't seen on the phone. This is the beauty of it all. As in that Holy Spirit, examine your life. Think of where God has put you, the gifts and talents he's given to you, the opportunities God lays before you. Drink deeply of Christ our Lord in this place. Not only for yourself, for your own spiritual edification, for the knowledge that you're a child of God, but for the people God sends you to meet. And then pray for boldness. That that same Holy Spirit who dwells in you might lead you to those God has sent you to. And that's the wonder and joy of evangelism. Is that when we pray that prayer, we never quite know where the Spirit will lead us, do we? But we know that that same Spirit, who's guided his church since the very beginning, is with us. And that the message we bring is a message of joy. As we pronounce the things that we've seen and heard in this place, Christ our Lord. It's in that hope, it's in that faith that we pray today. 
In Jesus' precious name, amen.